Where it starts to become an art is when you don't know where it's going to go and you don't know how it's going to turn out. I think it was the American psychologist Jerome Bruner who said there are two kinds of writers in the world. There are writers who write to tell people what they think or know and there are writers who write to find out. I am definitely one of the second. I've always thought of Martin as a polymath. He will very often talk about quotations that have captured his imagination and will discuss them and contextualise them and I find that very enriching. Martin has, I think, always been um, a bit of a sort of lone figure in a way in the, in, in the lettering world. He, I think, deliberately hasn't involved himself too much in the thick of societies and meetings and, and so on. And also the fact that he works in wood sets him apart quite a lot from other people. Uh, stone has tended to be um, a much more common material for people to use, partly because it's a heck of a lot easier <laughs> to carve. I used to think of what lettering artists do as a kind of performance. You're, you're taking the, the words of a poet and you're performing them visually. And I think this is a useful idea because I think it brings lettering language art into more of a relationship with other kinds of art. We're all of us, whether we're poets or musicians or novelists or representational artists or abstract artists or sculptors, we're all acting like prisms or lenses. We're getting strands from all over the place and we are the, the thing through which they are focused into a single point which is what we do, it's the poem we write, it's the composition. You're focusing all of that into what you're doing. And that's what we, I think, are, 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 as lettering artists, um, are trying to do. I've never lettered full time. It's always been in conjunction with other things. And then in 1998, I had to retire from the University of Leicester. And uh, shortly after that, we came to live here in North West Wales. I'm quite isolated here up in North West Wales, which in a way is good. Somebody once said, everybody should have the chance of not being over influenced, you know, and, and I think that's, I, I wouldn't want to be in the lettering scene in London. I, I mean, I'm not, I never have been, and I wouldn't really want to be. It's, no, I think you'd be seeing a bit too much of other people's work. I like to burble away on my own, you know. I think the other thing about uh, lettering, if you like, as art, rather than practical lettering in terms of typography or whatever, is that in a sense, you're deliberately hiding the meaning or at least reveals it a bit more slowly so that when the reader is reading it, they can't necessarily read it very clearly straight away. Um, it maybe takes a bit of effort for them to read it. Um, or even perhaps it's very, very difficult indeed and they need to refer to some other text so that they can work out what it says. I think interpreting Martin's work really does take time. First of all, one may get what the quotation is, and that isn't always easy to see at first glance. Then one's got to think about the medium that he's chosen and the way in which he's used that medium. And what I find particularly fascinating is the way in which he would take quotations and choose different ways in which to express them. Very often with poets, a little bit of their own poem doesn't bite them in the way it bites me. It jumps off the page at me, uh, but it doesn't with them. Because I often go back to words, you see, I'm sometimes almost obsessively. There's certain bits of T.S. Eliot I keep on going back to. 
I think a lot of people who are starting out on this think that the carving's the really hard bit, and then you just draw some letters, and, you know, but of course it isn't that at all. The design is far, and thinking about how it's going to work visually is far, far more complex and difficult. Alphabets, letters, particularly when they're hand-drawn, not so much when they're type, they, they have voice. It's as if somebody's talking. You know, it's, it's, it's not just individuality, they, they have a certain tone. They almost have taste, they're almost, some are sweet and some are sour and some are, you know, <laughs> um, which may sound a peculiar thing to say, but when you're thinking about the music of a piece of language, it's, it's very important. The modern era of letter carving, and in fact lettering in general in Britain, probably dates back to about the turn of the 19th, 20th century um, with key characters like Eric Gill. And he sort of revived the art of carving um, lettering by hand in stone in, in a more artistic way than it had been. And Gill was a, a pupil of uh, Edward Johnston, who was the man who revived calligraphy. And so those are really two key characters in the whole story. And, and since then, there's been a movement of, of letter carving, calligraphy and so on in Britain, which continues to the present day. And most present letter carvers in Britain can trace their lineage of training, if you like, back to, uh, to Gill, um, as most calligraphers can back to Johnston. But there were people like the artist David Jones, who knew Eric Gill very well, was quite influenced by Gill, but very much went his own way, producing those quite irregular, um, very personal pieces that were not done to make a living. Um, they were done as gifts for friends and so on. Um, and they're very much compositions of forms and shapes and colours and so on. And he would also vary the letter forms quite considerably according to the, the meaning or the language even, because Jones used to mix um, Latin, English, Anglo-Saxon, Welsh and so on in, in, in one composition. Um, and certainly he was very sensitive to that and would use different letter forms for the different languages and so on. And it wasn't really until certainly the 60s and a couple of decades after that that people started doing things that were perhaps based more on poetic texts and where the letter forms were less designed to be just clearly read and as transparent, if you like, as possible. So Martin was doing something that I suppose um, took a slightly more calligraphic approach a slightly freer approach, if you like, to, to the design of the lettering um, at a time when there weren't many other people doing that kind of thing. I just enjoy the physical activity of doing it. It's a constant process of problem solving. Every single cut you make, you may not actually have to think about it that much, but everyone is, you know, something could go wrong. There was a um, very influential writer on craft called David Pye. He contrasts the workmanship of risk with the workmanship of certainty. And he says somewhere, he says, um, think of a ring pull can. He said, no craftsman can throw away a ring pull can without a pang. He couldn't make one. And yet the machine makes hundreds of thousands of them perfectly every time. That's the workmanship of certainty. You set it up and it goes choo, 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 and off it goes. The workmanship of risk is when every move could be the wrong one. And carving's very like that. Um, and carving, I don't know, carving in wood is more like that than carving in stone, but it does have more, in some ways, more technical problems because you've got the grain has direction and you have to make your cut in the right direction or else you're going to be in real bad trouble. When I started to learn Welsh, I immediately realised that the letter forms I'd used up to that time were not going to work. They weren't right. They, they, they weren't, weren't the right sound on the tongue. And I started to realise that some of the difficulty I was having spacing letters was because the letter forms were too formal, they were too rigid. You know, a letter A was a letter A was a letter A, no matter where it came, no matter what it was next to. And then I started to look at um, older inscriptions, particularly some of the inscriptions from the uh, Roman catacombs. They had adapted the letter so that the letter responded to its place in relation to the other letters. 
and I started to do the same thing. So if I had um, a letter a T followed by a letter A, then uh, it's, fairly it's fairly obvious that the letter A can come underneath the crossbar of the T. What's a bit less obvious is that if you get a letter T followed by a letter R, let us say, then the stem of the R can lean inwards underneath the crossbar of the T. And I started to design inscriptions like this. And this was invaluable when, um, I, when I came to Wales because I'd already i already done a lot of this. And when I came to Wales, there were all these um, letter patterns. For example, um, a word like kerdur, uh, a walker. Ur, gur, a man. Kerd, kerded, to walk. Kerdur, a walking man. Very simple. Welsh is a very transparent language. It makes its compound words very simply. Just plonks one word next to another. Ping, you've got another word. Yeah, you know, we have all these different sounds coming out, and different letters in the alphabet. Double D, double F, N G, C H, T H. They're all single letters in a Welsh crossword. Double D fits into one square. Almost always in Welsh, the stress is on the penultimate syllable of the word. Manadoid mountains. And if it's two syllables, one mountain, manid, the stress comes on the first syllable. If it's a lot of mountains, manadoid, it comes in the middle syllable because they're three syllables, manadoid, it comes on the penultimate syllable. So the whole stress shifts in the word. I mean, it does it in English as well, but it does it in Welsh in a very obvious way. And of course, if you're a learner, you're learning all this and things become explicit to you which implicitly you know in your native tongue, but you've never thought of. And then maybe you go back and think of them and think, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like that in English, or it's very different in English. I use a lot of scrap, um, things other people throw away, driftwood, you know, things that don't, I haven't, I haven't bought wood for years, for goodness sake. You know, I don't buy wood, you don't find it, you know. <laughs> um, and so very often, uh, if not quite always, but in the overwhelming majority of cases, a piece of wood, by the time I get my hands on it, has got history. It's got form and that history is written on it. So I know uh, quite a lot's happened to it. So again, that means that there are certain things it could say and certain things maybe it couldn't say. Whenever you see a piece of carving, carved lettering, or a piece of calligraphy, um, your eye is inevitably drawn to the material and to the, uh, the way it's carved or the way it's written. The letter forms themselves form another kind of layer of, of language, if you like, which is a visual language of interrelationship of shapes and forms, the strokes of the letters, the planes of the, the V cut, if it's cut in a V section, um, all of which work together and at the same time, you're aware of the, um, the text, the language as well. So the two things work together in a rather mysterious way, which I don't think many people have really quite pinned down what's going on. Lettering art, to me, always has to have meaning as well as beauty of form. I think there's a great deal of thought in what he's portraying and an immense truthfulness. I and mean, one of the things I love about Martin is he's such a truthful person. And that quality shines through from his work. And even when that is most innovative, I think he's never doing things just for effect. He's doing things because he's excited by them, because he wants to stretch possibilities. And all that makes for really interesting works of art. I think one of the difficulties about an art based on visual language is that Basically, it's got to be contemplative and to get the best out of any kind of language art, you've got to sit down, you've got to look at it, preferably not in an illustration, preferably with the, the actual thing there in front of you, live with it, you know, stroke it if it's tactile, you know, get to know it and it will gradually start to, you'll talk to it and it will talk to you. It doesn't come leaping off the picture as, as a lot of pictorial art does. 
And this, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, I was in the gallery um, a few weeks ago and there was um, a big painting by uh, Albert Irvin there. The, the RA, all oh, very bright colours, wham, bam, splash, you know, psychedelic colours. Great, I love it, but it's not what I want to do. Not what I want to do. But and, and, uh, a little quiet pot by Ken Matsuzaki. Oh, wonderful, you know. And you live with it and you live with it and you live with it <laughs> and it just keeps on giving and if I can do that then that's that's as much as I can ever hope for really I think